Hello, it's uh, episode 199 of the franchise with your um, your two hosts over there. I'd like to introduce you to Henry Fool Papali, and over here on the ones and the twos, of course, Daniel Smart Guy Ehrenberg. <laughs> Daniel Smart Guy, very good. That's good. I, I was going to say Daniel Grimm Ehrenberg, but, you know, I don't know. D. Grimm. D. Grimm. The D. Grimm. H. Fool D. Grimm. Yeah. Love it. H. Rifle. D. Rifle. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. All right. All we're right. still in Hal Hartley land, meaning Woodside, Queens. And um, right. we're going to talk about the two follow-ups to Henry Fool, which are Faye Grimm from the year of our Lord 2006 and Ned Rifle uh, from 2014, the uh, Kickstarter piece. Our first Kickstarter movie, Henry. Is it really? I think Ever? probably, yeah. There aren't wow. that many. Gee, uh, yeah, that's true. It's a relatively recent thing. Wow. That's fascinating. Well, this is episode 199, folks. You know what that means. Does it mean something significant? I mean, to us, it does. I, I wouldn't say significant. So. I would say... No. It's a milestone. It's a number. Yeah. You know, like if we were a comic book, it would be slightly fatter. It might have a foil cover. <laughs> I think I yeah, did this really. bit when we did our 100th episode. I like it. I like it. It's like uh, when I used to do, what did I, I have that issue of Detective Comics. I think it's 500. And there's a big, big, awesome picture of Batman on it. And there's just old recycled stories in there. And they've oh, got sure. one goofy one, one serious one. Oh, yeah. sure. So it's one of those like maxi issues where there's yes. like a lot of That's... Batman writers and artists from the past. They're going to contribute to this baby. That's right. And at the very end, I, I still I, I have the issue. I remember the very end has a very cool like 20 page collage of different artists of Batman throughout the ages. So mm -hmm. that's, um, you know, very similar to what you're going to be getting here, except it's the same show with the same two hosts in the same tone. But obviously it's uh, it's worth. Your yeah, money. we can't. E we're not even going to do a double sized e e episode like this um, show's too long anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's the great part about our show. Uh, it, it's so long that it's already double a regular show, so it's totally fine. Everybody's going to be s very satisfied. I remember when we first started the show, I said to Henry, we're nobodies. We got to keep this baby under 60. Yeah, <laughs> and that lasted, honestly. It didn't because... last ever because I remember the first episode was like an hour, 10 minutes, and I was like, all right, that's okay, but next time let's keep it under 60. But there there had to be, and I want to look back at some point for next week, I want to see when did we truly cross the threshold and never look back. Because there had to still be times when you were telling me, right, and we were both like, okay, that was an exception. We're pushing the envelope. we got to rein it in. There's definitely a point where we were just like, uh, okay. Well, I think this there was a point where we were like, all right, let's keep it to 90 yeah, oh, definitely it got extended. Yeah, yeah. It got rationalized and extended. Yeah, it's like nice. a kid's bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And now, honestly, we've seemed to have found the groove at two hours, and occasionally, as we know, I we like to get it under two. I, I do not nice. like when we're over two hours. Yeah, it, it's tough. It's tough, but... Uh, I don't think we've oh, we've we've come to two and a half, and I think we've even had a two hour forty, maybe two hours. No 45. way, no, not even close, man. We've had a hundred, hundred and sixty. I don't think we've passed two twenty. Oh, that's not true. That's not true. Are you counting Patreon? No, I, I wasn't. What do you think? I mean, no, I'm thinking of our regular feed. I don't think we've passed two twenty. Correct me if I'm wrong, gang. We will have we will have show stats next week, courtesy of Space Cadet One, which we did in our hundredth episode as well. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so keep that in mind, Henry, when you choose the movies next week. Maybe not something that we need the entire episode to talk about. Something a little with more brevity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's funny. I'm looking at some of the old ones. Two twenty, two twenty five. Twenty five. Which one's that? Uh, all right. Well, uh, yeah, let's start. Exorcist two. The first Exorcist was okay. It's two twenty. All right, great stuff, Henry. Uh, we're talking about Faye Grimm and that rifle. Let's start. Uh, for... oh, sorry, I had one more thing. I'm so oh, sorry. Oh God, go. 
Jekyll All the Way was two hours and 26 minutes. Which one? <laughs> Jekyll All the Way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a special Christmas episode. Yeah, all right, let's go. Sorry. Okay. Woo! Faye right. Grimm by Hal Hartley, the follow-up to Henry Fool, comes to us nine years after the original. Um, it premiered at the uh, Toronto International Film Festival, on 9-11-2006, the five-year anniversary of 9-11. Oh, what no. a joyous occasion for a film about oh, terrorists. Why on earth would they do that? Why would they wow. program that? Oh, that's bad. That's bad. I mean, it didn't happen in Toronto, but, you know. Yeah, what the fuck, Canada? Do you not give a shit about our plight? Maybe they didn't know. We were still in recovery mode five years later, bro. We certainly were. I... I had been living in New York for almost two years at that point, and I we was definitely still like fresh in the air. You yeah, know? I mean, I know the mission had been accomplished by that oh, point. Years, years prior. Yeah, but uh, we were still like, uh, you know, Bin Laden was still alive. Oh yes, he was oh, hanging yes. around some caves Absolutely. and some probably facilities of some sort. Yeah, we were five years from getting him, I think, or four years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when we got him. We got him. I cried. Did you really? Yeah, I did. <laughs> wow, what a visceral reaction. It was weird. That is, I mean, I, I don't know if it's weird. It's just, I, I didn't. I mean, I, 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 I just remember, I, you know, you know what? Somebody I I texted me. I was playing a video game, actually, uncharacteristic of me, and I had to turn on the TV to watch it. I, I think my initial reaction was, was kind of um, political. I think I seem to remember my first reaction being, fuck yeah, Obama. I'm oh, glad it was. Oh, God. See, you're the problem with this country, Henry. People need to feel things more sincerely. No, that was sincere. I, We're I caught up in this political hubbub and hobnobbing. Yeah. It was a reflexive action. I couldn't help it. I was just so happy it was him and not Bush who got him. It was just like something so satisfying about that. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. guess. I guess that's true. You know what I mean? I was just because, yeah. No, we were all happy for Obama in the liberal sphere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gone. All right. All right. Uh, Faye Grimm, it was actually released in theaters in America anyway, May 18th, 2007. Part of the big 2007 wave. Might have gotten more notice in a different year. Yeah, it sure would have. Uh, yeah. Came in uh, at the box office, Henry, at number 356 for the year. Uh, Jesus. Took in $126,714 in 28 theaters. That's incredible, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's 28 theaters. Just okay. 28 theaters. Well, I also think that it, it was released uh, VOD, like day and okay. date kind of a situation. Sure. Yeah. Although it's 2006. I mean, was VOD that prevalent at this point, I guess? Maybe not yet. I mean, it could have been. I mean, we certainly we didn't have at that point yet. Uh, do we have cable with the like digital cable by that point? I think I didn't. we did, but I don't think we had like Netflix streaming. No, 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 no. Oh, you think it might have been like available on demand? That yeah, sort of thing? yeah, 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 it, maybe. Yeah, yeah. When it was less easy to do so, even. But yeah. yeah. God, that, just that transition moved so fast that I forget the different phases of it. It was instant. The VOD yeah. revolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's just 320. I mean, I know the movie's not uh, a blockbuster, but it's got gold bloom in it. Jesus Christ. We you can't, know, can't do anything. I think much. Cal Hartley made the right movie here and went about it in the wrong way. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right, we'll get to that. I, I think Hartley is the the type of dude to like. He, he he's like made all the right moves. He's just like done it in the wrong order, and it, it's like it, it's made him totally unnoticeable to wide swaths of the public. To yeah. me, like uh, making a, an espionage movie in two thousand six with with Parker Posey. And Jeff Goldblum is an interesting idea, but yeah. I, I, and and it's it's commercially not even a bad idea. Yeah, but I just think it's his entire tone. Well, that's it, the thing, man. Yeah, he he, he can like he he should be able to appeal to like spy nerds and like you know espionage weirdos, like genre people. But he he and, had uh, the idea to film this all in 
you know, in weird fucking Eastern Europe. On, yeah. yeah, and also just like fucking to make it a sequel to Henry Fool is such a bad idea. Henry oh, Fool think, was like a yeah. cult oddity by 2006, I guess. But I think the type of people who would be interested in this movie are not Henry Fool fans. And I think the type of people that would go see this movie have never even heard of these characters. That's a very interesting take. I, I didn't really even think about that. I mean, I did have the thought while the movie was kind of going insane a little bit for a while. I was thinking, like, why not just make this a standalone movie? Well, yeah, as then, a Henry Fool fan, this didn't yeah. appeal to me. But I yeah. wonder if it would have more if I was just watching it as a Hal Hartley experiment. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I, I But I, I, what I did like was the continuation of a character from Henry Fool getting a feature film the idea of it becoming what it became is is debatable no, no, but the absolute yeah. right move if you're going to sequelize yeah. henry fool is to focus on the parker posey character right but not but in this way this? <laughs> i know yet i found myself strangely into it i knew you'd like uh, this one yeah i'm I not mean... a fan of this movie oh really this to okay. me is the weakest of the three by a by a lot well i i Spoiler alert! I I actually agree. Oh, okay. I wrote my ranks that my rankings down. Obviously, just three movies, but Fagram is the weakest. Mm -hmm. Um, but I still liked it uh, quite a bit. I think its its main weakness is it goes off on too many tangents and it's too long. You know, uh, well, it is fucking too long, dude. This is a long. fucking genre experiment. This has no business yeah. being more than like an hour and twenty five minutes, like the next uh, one. Exactly. It's 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 really long, but. Parker Posey's She's fantastic. great. The whole cast is great. It's nice yeah. to have Goldblum there. It's got a, a few Hal Hartley regulars that weren't in the last one, which is nice to see. The build up to seeing Henry Fool is done very well. I think that's true. Very, true, and the the first reveal of him is really it's, effective. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Yeah, the payoff is very good. I think, but um, we take a lot of roads to get there that become so farcical as to be almost uh, fish called Wanda meets John Le Carre meets Wes Anderson. It, it's the type of complicated plot where I I get the sense that the complication of it is a feature not you know not a bug like it's the I, I think the the point is if you were to sit down and read all of this point by point like to try and suss out what the plot is it still wouldn't make sense yeah 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 the dialogue especially by Goldblum in a lot of the uh, explanations is so rapid fire about who's doing what and, and where's even fucking drier than the first one yeah, very. You're right. You're right. Uh, and that, al that almost is helped by the way the camera moves. And the, 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 oh, the I've got a big problem with the camera in this movie, Henry. Uh, well, what was this film? What was this filmed in Holland? Because I'm looking at a lot of Dutch. <laughs> going Dutch. A little too going Dutch here. Every shot. The whole movie is Dutch angles. Did you notice? No. Explain to me, remind me what that is. Is that this? Like, yeah, that? yeah, everything's a tilt. Yeah, 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 you're right. I guess I, I noticed it a few times, but it didn't, I forgot about it. It's the whole it. movie. I read an interview with Hal Hartley where he said there's two shots in the movie that aren't Dutch angles, and it's just because he forgot to tilt the camera. Oh, God. God, he's a weird guy. What, yeah. why, what, 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 did he explain why? I don't fucking know, man, just because it's like a weird movie. But like to me, like Dutch angles should be used like for effect. Like when you're right. looking at something normal and then something gets a little weird, you Dutch up the angle a little bit. Yeah, interesting. You I... don't make an entire movie of Dutch angles. What the fuck, dude? That's not pleasant to watch. I, I, isn't that weird, though? I didn't. I don't recall noticing it that much, but I mean, now that I'm thinking back to the sequences in the film where it's kind of static, presumably a lot of the shots of Parker Posey in streets and all the shots in their house back in Queens, all those shots are definitely, uh, definitely Dutch angles. Every time Jeff Goldblum's explicating something or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. I love Goldblum's partner, by the way, that actor. I like him. I, I know him from something. You know him as Bubbles' weird meth friend in The Wire. 
Holy. You remember his young white boyfriend, Johnny, yeah. or whatever? <laughs> yeah. He's Holy that guy. Shit. Okay. Wow. All right. Yeah, I see him pop up and stuff every so often. He's also, like, one of the main guys and one of the main kids and fucking kids. Oh, well, yeah, didn't see it, but okay. Yeah. He's, like, sort of a Paul, a, a, a chubby Paul Dano. He's not chubby. <laughs> I mean, maybe he was chubby in this um, one. Oh, I mean, round, round, very roundy cheeks, rounded cheeks. <laughs> I guess, but he was when he was like playing a fucking crackhead in The Wire. He was pretty skinny. Uh, I gotta try. I'm, I remember the character, but I don't remember what he, him what he looked like in that. Anyway, um, so Faye Grimm. I mean, is it even like what do we do with this plot here? It, it's not even <laughs> worth getting into, but it should be said right off the bat. That your reading of the end of Henry Fool was way closer to the mark than mine was. I, I guess so. Yeah, when it t- came on, I, I was surprised that I suppose I read it right, uh, even though they trickled some doubt into there. But and even though I'd seen this fucking movie. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I get it. I mean, on a on a rewatching after many many years, but yeah. So he 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 did get on the plane and he was racing towards the plane in Henry Fool. Uh, but FYI, they even... the flashback of him on the plane immediately showing him inexplicably drinking a can of Budweiser on the plane was great. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know they uh, basically fill you in a little bit on what went on but it's it's it, it very seems that it seems that Faye and Henry were together for 7 years before he took off um and uh he is Simon in prison in this movie Yes yeah Simon yes. is in is in prison um which for the thing he did Henry Fool. Yeah, that's yeah. sort of ignored in the next movie. Maybe Hal Hartley thought better of that plot development at some point. Well, but, he's he's out by the end of it, in the middle of of Fagram. Yeah, middle. I know, but they don't even really mention like he's he's treated in Ned Rifle like he's one of the great poets in America. They even mention that he was a laureate at some point. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or right, that he was right. the what is it, what is it called, Henry? The what's like the head poet in America called? Oh, I thought they. Co- I think you're right, like a Nobel laureate or uh, something like but that. But what am I thinking right? of? I thought that's what you're thinking. You know of. what? You know, it's like the top poet, the number one guy, a poet laureate, like the Robert poet Frost. laureate. Right, right, right. Yeah, like Robert Frost. Who's that, that right now? Like, um, I think it's uh, Jim Morrison, posthumously. Shut up. <laughs> Who's the current Nobel laureate? Shouldn't we know that? Oh, God, is it Kid Rock? I have- that sounds close. I would say that's probably close. Maybe Sean Spicer. <laughs> Is he a good poet? Uh, looks like uh, it's Joy Harjo. <laughs> Joy Harjo. Sure, sure. The great Joy Harjo. Wow. Don't yeah, know her. Me, me okay. neither. She's uh, looks like an older Asian woman. Oh, no, Native American. Well, that's nice. That is nice. That couldn't have been a Trump pick. No, 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 no. <laughs> she, no, no. I, I guess she had nothing. To, he had nothing to do with that. Uh, is that decision. That's not. Is that picked by? That's not. Picked this by was. Uh, she was nominated in 2019. Yeah, but that's that's picked by like a committee, I think, like the Nobel winners. Oh, maybe. I yeah. guess I always thought like the the president was like, "You're my favorite poet. You're well, my laureate." They, they can give like medals of freedom and all that. Like Obama gave Philip Roth. Some oh, right. Or Trump gave John Voight. Did he really? Yeah. The fuck did he give him? He gave him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Jesus fucking Christ. Ugh, you didn't know that? No. It was great. Uh, <laughs> the the presentation of the award is very funny. You should look oh, it up I online. It. Fuck it. Bet it is. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So um, Simon let Henry pose as Simon. And go to Sweden, but Henry didn't do it to like, you know, piggyback on Simon's literary success, which is kind of what I thought. He right. he just goes to get away from the murder, from murdering Kevin Corrigan, which is what you said. Right, but you, 
No, but you, we were both right because I did say the latter, but you did say, I missed, remember, I completely missed that he was like giving him his own identity. To oh, take that's it. right, yeah. But, oh, so it was a combo. Yeah, it was definitely a combo, but then at the Henry, very end, we, it's, together, we <laughs> are as smart as one good writer. Either that or it literally takes two mediocrely brilliant minds to decipher a Hal Hartley plot. Mediocrely brilliant? I couldn't... I, listen, the Faye Grimm plot, I am never attempting. I don't care at remotely enough to try and decipher this plot. I, know, I did give up, but I, I will confess I didn't give up till about 90 minutes in. That's it's crazy. Just, I was yeah. gone like 35 minutes Smart. in. Smart. Man, smart man. I, as I wait, I was in it all the way until like the terrorist things start happening. Then I was like, all right, I really don't understand this. And when Goldblum like goes to Europe, I was like, mm -hmm. I, I give up, I give up. But, um, but it turns out at the very end of this, you and I are, we're still, I mean, well, obviously, cause we weren't told, but we're both wrong. Cause he didn't really go to sweden he got off with a stewardess on the flight i love that he seduces a stewardess <laughs> who weirdly and this is kind of a strange part of the plot too she of everything she tells Faye is a lot of flashbacks in this movie she eventually tells, yeah 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 she tells how she was like obsessed with him and in love with him but but she leaves him he doesn't leave her. She leaves him like in the middle of the night. And and it, it's very strange. Like that's not really explained either because they, they seem to go together. She steals his money or something and then she leaves him. It's very odd. And then she's confused with a terrorist named BB. It's oh, very yeah. Weird. Yeah, it's 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 very weird. Mm -hmm. I it feel is. like Hartley's just kind of wanting to write a spy thriller but just completely put not just his own spin but parlay his older characters into it somehow and that's where maybe you were stepping in with the it just doesn't really work perhaps. i think it i think it's a shot at these kind of thrillers i think he's trying to show that he loves a good espionage movie but at the same time aren't they convoluted look how convoluted they are they're yeah. impossible to keep track of yeah yeah, I mean, and and like you said, the dryness of all the delivery, and of course, as you would say, you know, gold blooms just gold blooming all over this thing. Sure it, is, man. Oh my God, I mean, he didn't bother me. I love Jeff Goldblum for the record, but I he can you know do his thing a little too much, but and he is really doing his thing. But he so Hartley creates these worlds where it's like we said last week how it's kind of mammity and. It it doesn't really bother me as much as I feel like it should. I also think Goldblum is pretty good at knowing when a movie needs him to Goldblum it up. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a smart guy. He never struck me as like a fucking idiot actor. I don't. No, know. I mean he's out. He's out there, but right. Yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. Um, I I noticed a fun thing in the opening credits, Henry. The ones that went on for the first nine minutes. <laughs> yeah. Which I hate. I fucking hate that. It's always been my I can't stand that. But now yeah. executive producer Mark Cuban. OK, I'm so glad you brought that up. Is that the Mark? Cuban? It certainly is, Henry. And um, what I'd like to do right now is um, is do a little scene study of. Uh, oh, I, you know what, Henry? I actually have uh, some dark net footage. Okay. Okay. Wow. Very cool. Who who's this going to be of? Okay, it's Hal Hartley in the Shark Tank pitching Faye Grimm <laughs> to Mark Cuban. Oh my God, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Wow. Okay. 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 So let's hear Hal start. Okay. All right. Hey. Uh, hey, Mark. Mark, it's nice to the be here. The other sharks are here too. You don't just have to greet me. There's uh, Lori Grenier, um, Damon John, Barbara Corcoran, and uh, Mr. Wonderful himself, Kevin O. Kevin o uh, Leary. I'm sure it's a great uh, preponderance of personality to meet uh, all of these uh, multi multifaceted, uh, amazingly uh, effervescent uh, people. 
M- Mark, I I have a a quandary and a query. If you're in so so inclined to uh, hear me out, all right, give me the name of your project. I want you to say uh, how much money you're asking from me and um, what percentage of the uh, of the uh, thing you're offering. Okay, um, so the movie is called Faye Grimm. I need about. Uh, Mm, uh, $400,000 and uh, you can have um, uh, all of it. I don't need any royalties. I don't do these for money. <laughs> You're offering 100% of this movie, Faye Grimm, to me, Mark Cuban. Absolutely. I'm a, I am used to like basketball. I admire athletic ability, uh, uh, overrated and uh, anti-intellectual as it may be. Well, listen, I don't like I don't like the cut of your jib, Hal, because what I like is a hustler and I like someone who wants to make money from this. Uh, listen, I don't work with entrepreneurs who aren't going to get out of bed to make me money. OK, so if you're not looking to make any money from this enterprise, I don't see how you can make something that is going to give me money. Am I going to get back my four hundred thousand uh, dollars? I know that I get 100 percent of the grosses. But what if there are no grosses? Tell me that. Uh, what what I can do is I can I can talk to a, a friend of mine named uh, Parker and uh, I can have her uh, uh, pitch you uh, an idea because uh, about maybe getting a percentage of what she brings to the table, uh, because even if it's not uh, remuneration of the uh, highest serviceable kind, uh, we might be able to uh, work out something that is more uh, agreeable to parties concerned. Parker who? Parker Lewis can't lose. You got to You got to talk to me here. Parker Posey, uh, she was in a movie that you might have admired. Uh, she was in a cinematic uh, film uh, by the Criterion Collection, adopted it onto DVD and Blu-ray recently uh, for uh, called Dazed and Confused, and uh, that is a popular movie. She's that hot bitch from Scream 3, right? She uh, is indeed uh, somebody of the female uh, figure who is has an appealing uh, exotic sexuality uh, mixed with a homespun ne- girl next door. Quirky. All right, let me cut you off right there. Listen, no. <laughs> um Hear me out. Listen. Um, yes, yes. Now, she's not going to bring in the grosses. She's an indie darling. I get it. But, uh, right? Yes. Right? Listen, yeah, it, right? Well, in a way of, in a manner of speaking, uh, she is the indie queen. I didn't ask you to speak. I just said right. Uh, now, I I want you to know that uh, I, we need something greater. I need a name in this project. Well, I have, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, the uh, film The Fly or Invasion of the Body Snatchers, or perhaps maybe you've heard of this this f- uh, movie. Uh, I had I do not say film, I say movie called Independence Day. There's an actor named uh, Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, right. He's the tall guy from The Tall Guy, right? That I, I believe th- that's correct. That's right. That's right. That is a, that's absolutely correct. And uh, he can bring uh, a, a gravitas to the project that I'm trying to undertake by uh, uh, asking for your help here, Mr. Cuban. All right. You'll film this uh, on the cheap, right? Uh, we're going to film it under the Q train uh, in uh, in Queens. Uh, but then we we do sort of need to go to Budapest for a little bit and Turkey and oh, and uh, and Bulgaria and and Ireland. Can I sell DVDs at Dallas Mavericks games? I think that that would be a great way to sell the movie uh, uh, if you're a troglodyte type of fans who watch. Athletic. All right, you got a deal. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, you will dum, not dum, be. Dum, 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 dum. <laughs> All right. <laughs> wow. God. Boy, those guys were mismatched. God, I love the fucking Shark Tank, man. How did he even get uh, I Mark Cuban just went for that shit? It's weird that that he didn't that well, you know, I think he appreciated that Hal was speaking directly to him and not acknowledging any of the other sharks. I it didn't surprise me that that's how Hartley spoke uh, n- nor the overabundance of, a lot of big words, a lot of five dollar uh, words there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was fascinating. So that explains it, folks. Now you know how why the fuck Mark Cuban was involved. Yeah, I wonder if he just wanted to dabble, you know, dabble in film. He dabbles. He dabbles in... a lot in film, Henry. Have you looked oh. at Mark Cuban's IMDb page? No, I do. I wouldn't think he'd had one. Oh, it's, I are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I I do nothing else. I just wanted him to buy the Mets. That's all I wanted him to do, and he wouldn't. He couldn't do it. Listen to this, Henry. So many great producer credits from Mark Cuban, including Tim and Eric's billion dollar movie. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. Listen to this. He's executive producer on The Road, Steven Soderbergh's The Girlfriend Experience, James Gray's Two Lovers. Not a bad thing yet that you've mentioned. Well, I'm skipping the bad ones. 
Okay. It's okay. <laughs> Keep going with the good. He did the Black Christmas remake, the first one, not the second one. He did The Jacket. He produced Good Night and Good Luck. He ex- wow. uh, Enron documentary, that thing. That was good. Yeah, how about that? Interesting. Mark Cuban, always hustling. Well, he's a smart guy. I mean, yeah. You got to love him. I, he should run for president. He has talked about that. I don't well, know he, why he didn't. He, he should. I'm not saying, yeah. like, he'd be my top choice, but, like, if Mark Cuban was the Democratic nominee, I'd vote for him. Fuck, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll take him. All right. Interesting, All right. interesting stuff. I want to talk about um, what is potentially Hal Hartley's first ever action sequence, <laughs> which takes – it's a big shootout in a stairwell. And uh, because he's Hal Hartley, he decided to shoot the entire thing in a series of still shots. Yes, uh, very strange. What a fucking uh, go- jerk! I, <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of what that reminded me of. Uh, it'll come to me that that exact type of it almost isn't there. Isn't in Buffalo '66? Doesn't Gallo use that for a couple of sequences? Yeah, probably. Where there's, where there's like photographs of violence or something as opposed to uh and Run Lola Run does it too to 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 show action without showing action. They just flash you back to photographs. Yes. I think Run, it's Lola, a Run. little bit more timid than I want from Hal Hartley. I would I would love to see Hal Hartley really like go for it and try to actually do an action sequence if he's going to bother to make an espionage movie. Well, uh, it's true. I mean, there there is some running and there's an explosion. Yeah, there's but, some rooftop running in this movie. <laughs> yeah, but there's not really a lot of, you're right, kind of single camera following hand-to-hand combat or pushing or shoving or anything like that. He does action sex sequences. He's into that. He can he can, he can figure that out. What's there, Was there an action sex sequence in this? Well, in Ned Rifle there was. Oh, sure, sure. Well, yeah. um, uh, Henry Fool does join the Mile High Club in this movie. Yes, definitely, definitely, for sure. You ever do that, Henry? You ever fuck on an airplane? Uh, I can't say that I have. Me no. neither. Yeah. It'd be fun. I, I'd pro- I'd I don't know. I'd, I'd be uncomfortable fucking on an airplane. I feel like maybe a hand job in the seats would be all right. That would be fine. Yeah, under I, the blanket. I, actually, I, I agree with you. I mean, like, it, it, you know. It, Especially if it's across somebody in the middle. Like, if we were right. sitting on the inside <laughs> and the outside. Yeah, I mean, like, the... I think maybe like 20 years ago, pre 9 11, I could I would have done it, but now well, it was a free for all before 9 11. Exactly, I feel and like people so, were fucking in the aisles. They were. I mean, dude, I'm old enough to remember people smoking on fucking airplanes. Man, mm. it was awesome, you know. But now you can't get away with anything. If you were trying to go to the bathroom to have sex, are you kidding me? They, there's no way it would. You, I, I don't know how people do. Only rich people can I used to get away with drinking on planes. I would I would pack all my own Sounds alcohol. Nice, though, yeah, but I'm not oh, paying money for that booze. You still were able to get booze on there? They didn't check for that? They never. I, I, I always had it in plain sight in my fucking bag, and nobody ever took anything from me. I haven't flown in ages. Over a decade, I haven't been on an airplane, so I don't, I don't remember the Wow. wow, interesting. I yeah. feel like there's been advancements in uh, plane technology I, that you've I, missed out on. <laughs> Does, do you still taxi? Do you still do the taxiing when you're waiting in the runway? I have done that. Yeah, yeah. That's a taxiing. thing. Okay. The <laughs> l- la- landing gear goes up. When the when the flight, you still hold on to the the the. Yeah, I don't think like they've reinvented airplanes. I just think there's maybe some little things that you might notice if you were on one. Does the stewardess still get up in front and give that little demonstration about the oxygen mask? Yeah, but sometimes they do fun shit with it. They'll sing a song. Get the fuck out of yeah. here. Yeah. You're playing with me. I'm not. They sing a song? Sure, like w- with all the safety things in there. Oh, my God. If the oxygen runs out and we're crashing, just grab your yellow mask. If we're falling at 400 miles an hour in the Atlantic Ocean, grab your flask. Keep going. I don't know. I was lucky to come up with that. Oh, are you remember. kidding me? I, I thought you were on a roll. Well, I, I came up with flask as the final rhyme. And Yeah, I, I know. I, you had trouble with that word. I could tell. I did. <laughs> I, did. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't. I didn't want to ruin it after that. So. Okay. 
That's our safety guidelines for what Pan Am. Pan Am. <laughs> I, I've, I've got some. I've got some bad news for you, Henry. <laughs> Are, 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 they, are they no? Uh, are they out of business? They're out of business. Yeah. You know, Pan Am was dead by the time I was flying, but I I was on a TWA flight at some point. I remember I that. Sure. My parents had a TWA credit card when I was growing up. I remember that. Oh well, yeah. TWA was the. Remember, I told you the story. Uh, we had to go to Katie Forte's fucking dad would have us on a class trip to the airport. Yes. Yeah, that yes. was TWA. TWA, that's mm-hmm. right. Transworld Airlines. You remember that? Started by Juan Tripp. Good for you. Let's go back and forth with um, acronyms. Okay, right. CVS, Consumer Value Store. I had no idea. That's... <laughs> Is yeah. that really what it means? Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right, give me uh, one. <clears throat> um, Pan Am. What is it? Oh, I thought you were going to supposed to answer it. No, no, just... it, we're going back and forth. I, I want to. This is like Pan a game. Ameri- American Airlines. I mean, that's barely one, but fine. ATM, automated teller machine. All right. Um, Mac machine. Do you money. not get this game? Mac machine, money access center. Oh, I don't even know what that is. ATM. It's what they call it in Pennsylvania. A Mac machine. The fuck is going on in Pennsylvania? Well, I wouldn't know I? what I'm doing. <laughs> I can't yeah, think of any more easy. acronyms. Yeah, no, it's very hard. It's very hard. AARP, yeah. the American Association of Retired People. NRA. The oh, this is getting easier. No, no, no. The National Recovery Act. That's what it meant when FDR implemented it before the NRA hijacked it. You're exhausting. There you go. It's like the WWF thing. I'll never fucking forgive the World Wildlife Federation for taking WWF from the World Wrestling Federation. Did they? World Wildlife Fund, maybe? No, yeah. Wildlife Fund, good job. Uh, but I, yeah, well, I didn't ever realize that the World Wildlife Fund took it after. I, I thought they were No, around. they had it before, but then the WWF, the World Wrestling Federation, took <laughs> off, and like fucking assholes, they couldn't just let them have it. It's like it's not like people were getting the two things confused. Yeah, that's... <laughs> they, when they are mailing in their donations, they were worried it was going to go to r- ravishing Rick Rude <laughs> and not the, ko- not the koalas. Yeah, that, that's pretty petty. I got news for you. Rick Rude could have used it as much as the fucking koalas. Couldn't Jake the Snake Roberts could have used it too. Yeah. Yeah, he would have just spent it on booze. That's yeah, true. It's mm. true. All yeah. right, Henry. Uh, you, <laughs> fake, fake Grim. Clearly not. Um, you know, uh, a what? huge conversation piece for it's us. It's weird because when you're watching Faye Grim, it it it's not like Henry Fool because it's just so silly and and it it goes on a very long time. But I gotta say, it I found it engrossing. Uh, I don't want to say always entertaining. I found it engrossing, though. I, I despite myself, mm. so I am giving it three stars. I'm gonna give it two. I, I think it's Hal's maybe weakest movie. I mean, I can't speak to that, but okay, really, yeah, that w- or my see. least favorite, anyway. Like, if you told me you preferred this to No Such Thing or something, I'd be like, fine. But um, I, I, I think this is the weakest one. Okay. All right. Well, who who's your who's your MVP? I mean, it's tough. Uh, I, I liked a, a few people in the movie. Um, you know, my instinct is to go Parker or Jeff Goldblum, but I kind of liked some of the smaller choices uh, from other actors. So, um, I am gonna go with BB. She's good. She's really she's... good, at, and she's been in a ton of Hal Hartley stuff. And I like the uh, the terrorist. I really liked his scenes with Henry, like when he's just like his old friend, which we didn't talk about at all. But they which have terrorist? a terrorist. Well, Henry's friend, uh, I think his name's Jalal. And they're oh, like, that guy. Yeah, he's pretty good, too. I really like him. You're like, you know, Henry, it's very difficult to be your friend. Mm-hmm. And like, it's just like they have that whole back and forth. I really liked, you know, I mean, I think everybody in the movie is very good. I had a very hard time uh, picking an LVP. 
Uh, uh, well, just just so we say their fucking names, your MVP is a fella named Anatole Taubman. Who yes, and Jaleel. that's not my MVP. I oh, just he's said, not. Okay, uh, I, but I'll say that mine. Oh, right, Saffron Burroughs was in this fucking movie too. I forgot. Yeah, she, you know what? She, I like her, but she's kind of. You might have just given me my LVP. No, she, I liked her in this. Yeah. I, my, I so really... my MVP is Alina Lowenstone. That's the okay. actress's name. Yeah. Yeah. She uh, was in Schindler's List. Right. I saw that. <laughs> uh, I uh, my MVP is Parker Posey. I mean, come on, she's amazing, and I was so fun to just see her just take a whole movie, no matter what the quality. <laughs> it was just great to see her. She owns every scene. She's fucking great. Yeah. She's just so appealing and smart and hilarious uh, she's great she's great she's the best she's one of my favorite parker actresses posey. ever yeah parker posey uh lvp uh i don't know I, I like i said i liked everybody but i guess if i had to pick the saffron burroughs character kind of comes and goes for no real reason at all um well, and, it, she, it, and nothing happens for a reason yeah right right i know yeah so but that that's who's getting it. Who, who's your lvp I don't know. There's so many spy characters. <laughs> I know. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at the list here. Nothing's really standing out, but uh, I don't know, man. You That's got how anything? I well, I gave you Saffron Burroughs. I mean, I, I yeah, but um... I kind of like Saffron Burroughs. I really don't think. I, I think it, Hal Hartley's my LVP. He got in his own <laughs> way on this one. That's fine. That's fine. Um, I'll, I'll say also the surprise of the returning cast. I thought the dude who played um, Simon's book editor was really fucking good in this movie. He was very good. And we also will talk about this in Ned Rifle because we didn't really talk about it at all here. But I thought one of the nicest things, one of the most interesting things of Faye Grimm was getting to see James Urbaniak speak way more he's like completely evolved clearly as a character which i thought was a very cool touch it's very natural i think he speaks very... even more in ned rifle i, I think that... urbaniak is doing a thing where he's like actually playing the evolution of that character in the growth. absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely so he's very verbose which is completely different than we've seen we've seen him before yeah well, he was pretty so... laconic in the last one that he was so we have a small uh superhero count so here we go how many three all right, I know one off the top of my head. Two. <laughs> if I may, Saffron Burroughs played Victoria Hand on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm pulling it up here, sorry. Uh, yeah, yes. That was wow. exciting at the time because she was like a recently created Brian Michael Bendis character and they brought her into the TV show. It was, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, that's one. Uh, of course, Jeff Goldblum played. Yeah, in uh, Thor Ragnarok. And Guardians 2. He played the Games Master or something. Close enough for me, Grandmaster. <laughs> sure. Uh, and, and who else is the other one? Anatoly Taubman. Oh, your boy. Uh, What's he in? Yeah, Jalal. Uh, he was in Captain America, the first Avenger, playing a character named Roder. So you and I have both seen him in a Marvel movie and probably don't remember it at all. I, I mean, should... but he's like one of those actors. He's probably has small roles in a ton of things, and I'd never recognize him. Yeah, true, 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 true. So, yeah, I feel like we didn't really do Fagrim the greatest justice, but maybe we did. I think I think the the all over the place nature of this conversation reflected the all over the placeness <laughs> of the movie. Yeah, and actually uh, I shouldn't detract because we got to hear that dark web thing which I was not expecting and that was very that was worth the price of admission. I yeah. think so, Henry. Uh right. let's talk about Ned Rifle. Uh this came to us uh Hal Hartley put up a thing on Kickstarter where he was seeking $384,000 um, to help fund his latest film. Uh, and he got 1,789 donors and uh, took in $395,292. So he uh, surpassed his goal and got yeah. to make this movie. Um it came out, uh, it premiered again at the Toronto Film Festival September 7th, 2014. Ooh. Yeah. What? 
No, no, I'm just glad they missed it by four days this well, time. Well, it takes place in September. You, you can't miss it by a lot, but you didn't have to put it on the fifth anniversary. <laughs> you ever been to a film festival besides a New York one, if you've ever been that? I, I, I don't know. I don't have been... that that much interest. Yeah, I don't, I don't either, but... Uh... Like Sundance at Toronto, I've I've had opportunities and I just never took Have them. Have so you? Maybe... Who gave you those opportunities? I I knew a guy who went to the Toronto Film Festival every single year, and I could have gone, and I just didn't. What and year was it? This would have been in uh, I think the late nineties. Mm. Um, yeah, you could have seen like uh, the Theory of Flight. Yeah. <laughs> the other sister. Ooh, I don't think that was at film festivals, man. Uh, you know why I thought of it? Why? Because I think the theory of flight's also about like a disabled person. Oh, really? Yeah, but that uh-huh. theory of flight's like the indie version, and that's Gary Marshall. Mm. Oh, uh, yeah, true. Good hey, point. it's me. If you see the other sister, you're definitely gonna see Hector Elizondo. Gary, stop it. There's serious <laughs> things happening down there. Those two don't have time to talk about your movies about flying. Well, of course they do. There's nothing going on. Stay in. Watch The Other Sister. I recommend it. We're up here in heaven, Gary. Those people on Earth are having a tough time with this corona business. Corona? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't know anything. All I'm saying is if you're going to be uh, consciously uncoupling or, uh, you know, uh, spatially reasoning or what have you, just uh, stay in. Watch the other sister. Gary, did you get a brain implant in heaven? Because you don't know what those words even mean. We don't need to think anymore in heaven. I'm spending all my time watching old Laverne and Shirley reruns. I think you're watching Hal Hartley movies and getting too big for your britches. Hal who? Exactly. (laughs) All right, Ned Rifle. Uh, So, I mean, let's get right into it. Now, I loved the opening shot of this movie, and I don't know this to be true, but I took it as a commentary on the... the, um, the transition between Faye Grimm and Ned Rifle. Because it starts with Ned kneeling on a tilted on a hill, okay? So it looks right. like it's a Dutch angle because the ground is tilted. Jesus, I don't even remember this. Okay. Yeah, but he's by it, the crucifix, right? Mm, I don't the remember. Big he's cross. praying or whatever. He's outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And yep. uh and the camera but the camera is straight on Ned, so we're seeing him right on, and then he gets up and walks away. And I think that's saying like none of that bullshit anymore. <laughs> we're back on solid ground now. Maybe. All right. Mm-hmm. Since since I missed clearly missed the Dutch angles, uh it did, I wouldn't have noticed. But all right, yeah. All right, so what's Ned been up to? He uh, is in the witness protection program. Faye, his mom, is in prison, uh, and he is living with a very Christian family who has um, influenced him to become very Christian as well. Yeah. Um, The dad is a a preacher played by Martin Donovan, uh, Hal Hartley regular. It's funny, like this movie is a real Hal Hartley all-star cast. Yeah, I noticed Robert John Burke for like 40 seconds. I, I didn't no- recognize him. I had to go back. I was like, I thought fucking Robert John Burke That's was in this That's funny, movie. and I did. And I, I've barely seen the guy except for fucking Thinner and whatever weirdo shit he's done. I, I don't know, but, uh, you know, I, I did want to mention he played uh, He played Chuck's grandfather on Gossip Girl. Obviously. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to mention something. I, I, di- I did want to ask your opinion about this. And this, this is fine for talking about it in Ned Rifle because it's totally applicable. Were you disappointed that all of the nonsense and all of the ramblings in the original movie, Henry Fool, weren't were, were propped up and and actually amounted to something in this movie's universe? R- r- meaning, are you disappointed that the direction Hal Hartley took is that the writings of Henry Fool actually have some sort of significance and aren't just complete bullshit? No, I kind of love that about it. I love that Simon won the Nobel Prize and became a laureate. That's interesting to me. That's different. I'm talking I, about Henry's writing. 
Henry's writing, I have more That's of a problem I mean. with it in Faye Grimm because it's being shuttled around and treated as significant and yeah. as as um, worth something. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it it bothers me less in Ned Rifle that he's sort of a struggling writer who is known by like the deeper Simon Grimm fans, but not really. Yeah, by anyone I agree. Else. I completely agree. But like, it kind of like I think if I see Henry Fool again, it's gonna maybe color and taint my view. Yeah, you know? it's a little bit making the subtext text. Yeah, and it completely changes sort of in a way the essence of Henry Fool, the the character, because it's like he's he's actually writing something that really, really, really means something different. And and so much is rumored about Henry in the first movie that like to me, if you're validating some of this stuff, does that also mean that he's actually an immortal being or whatever? Yeah. I know. I know. It's like demystifying something that was really funny because it was such fucking bullshit. It's like the Rob yeah. Zombie Halloween. <laughs> yes, exactly. There you go. Mm -hmm. Michael Myers' deconstruction of a character. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I rewatched Devil's Rejects recently. No interest, but how was it? That movie's good. Is it? Yeah. I never saw it. He had just... something with that one. Is that right? Yeah. Is there anything to be given to... Well, did he write and direct it? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. No, no. He, th that's his crowning achievement of his entire life. Bobby Zomb. Yeah. Uh, the devil. Sherry group. Moon is one of the weaker um, wives of famous people, though, who get to be in movies because their husband's famous. Okay, fair enough. I, I, I don't... Have I seen Sherry Moon in anything? Well, Halloween. Yeah, she played Michael Myers' mom. Oh, she's the mom. That's right. We talked about her. We sure did, Henry. Uh, um, who are, who are, are some of the worst? Who are some of the worst famous spouses? We just did the children a few weeks ago. That's right. So, no, so let's do this now. The worst famous spouse, like who like gets to be in all their right. spouses' movies and ruins them. Oh boy! Oh boy! Um, Jeez, uh, you got to help me out here. Uh, 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 who married famous? Who somebody that they'd married who wasn't famous? You know, well, here's I mean, the thing: you got Cap, Sean, Rita Wilson, always in the game. Shout out to Rita Wilson recovering from COVID nineteen. She was I, already an actress. It's not because of Tom Hanks she got to be in. Shit. Yeah, but their careers got a boost. Okay, okay, Capshaw. But Cherry, you're we're really talking about like this is now my wife. All right, she I'm gonna throw this. Uh, uh, here, here's this. Uh, right. Rebecca Pigeon, David Mamet's wife. I love Rebecca Pigeon. Fuck that. I think she's great. She Spanish sucks, prisoner, dude. Spanish prisoner. And you know it makes it even worse because he was married to a great actress and then like divorced her and married a shitty one. Lindsay Lindsay Krauss. Yeah, I, I, they call I that the, they call that the James Cameron when you do that. Ooh. Why don't you like Rebecca Pigeon? I, I mm, like, her. you know it. I don't like how she can't act. She has a certain delivery that is Taylor. It's specified to David Mamet. Of course, style. she does. It's just for David Mamet and nobody. Yeah, but else. all other. But there's plenty of other actors that can do it. And break into. They can do other things too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, well, I liked her. I was kind of in love with her when I saw Spanish Prisoner, right? I just oh, watched yeah. Heist, and it's like, you got Gene Hackman, Delroy Lindo, Sam Rockwell, and this lady. I really liked Heist when it came out. I, I don't know if it would hold up. It, it holds it, up. It's a good movie, but, like, yeah. Jesus Christ. You really don't, Jesus Heist. You really don't, <laughs> like, she's really not good in it? I don't, I don't remember that at all. I think I she's she poor. Great. I never Great. know what her characters are doing. Like, like I, I never know the motivations. There's no subtext right. to the performance. Do you think it's? I always thought it wasn't the subtext. Do you feel that way about her in the Spanish Prisoner? I yeah, always. I don't just know thought, what's going on with her. She's just I there. Think, I think it's Mamet's writing. I don't think it's her. But then why do I like Mamet's writing when it's being delivered by literally any other actor? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I dig her. I dig her. All dig right. the pidge. <laughs> the worst. Boy, this is a hard one. We're gonna have to come back to this. I, this is a tough spouses generally marry famous people, so 
Who brings a, a non-famous person into a movie? That's pretty unusual. I'm not saying they have to be a non-famous person, but I'm saying an actor that now gets to be in all of this other person's movies because they're famous. Okay, okay, okay. That changes it a, a, a tad. Um, Beverly D'Angelo married Al Pacino for a while. It's <laughs> not bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh, if we see, are we going to see uh, Keith Urban? Isn't who Nicole Kidman? Are we going to start seeing Keith Urban in movies? Is that going to happen? I would love it if Keith Urban started writing themes to all Nicole Kidman movies. Like every Nicole Kidman movie just ended with like a bro Bang. country song, <laughs> like Destroyer ends, and it's just like, yeah. hey, you got in too deep. <laughs> I want a little song about an Aussie girl, and then she went to New York and came another person girl. What's that? I just made that up. But what movie was it? Oh, I don't know. Just anything he writes. Why wouldn't be- you just do... Nicole Kidman's been in hundreds of movies. Why are you making up Nicole Kidman movies for this bit? I can't keep up with her uh, career, so I just figured there'd be something in the future. Um, sure, I can name another one. Um, let's do uh, 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 Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but that's pre-urban, man. Name a post-urban Kidman flick. How long they've been together? Long time. Well, now. it could be like uh, at the end of every episode, sort of like the crazy ladies in Monterey, California girls, murder time. Yeah. <laughs> He's like the leprechaun of country singers. He can't rhyme at the end of the song. How about it's, this? It's, How about this? Um. Looking for your family there in India, but you grew up here in Australia. Outback time, mom supportive. Go to the <laughs> land at the end of the movie. The third act's the least interesting part. You're gonna love this lion movie. I want to tell you a story about a blonde bombshell. She was for Fox <laughs> News. All hell worked out there with the Gretchen Carlson, and she worked with the right wing Hannity folk. It didn't turn right out for, her, but you got a settlement. That's Palm Shay. I like that he only wrote about the Nicole Kidman character. That's fun. That's a fun wrinkle. A, well, of course. Yeah. He has to make it singular. Yeah. All right. So Ned is living with this uh, Christian family. Um, it's his 18th birthday, so he can leave witness protection if he so chooses. Um, um, he gets a Bible for his birthday, and uh, his uh, stepsister puts in a pretty sexy naked picture of herself in there. Yeah. Uh, I was like, sex? man, I was thinking Hal Hartley really uh, ahead of uh, ahead of the world on the whole uh, step porn revolution. I didn't really think of her as a stepsister, uh, but okay. Well, I mean, I, mean, I got like the a... sense he'd been living with his family since he was like thirteen or something. Uh, yeah, you know, it's. I just got the impression they they he was like it was like a big parish where like all these kids sort almost like a sort of an, a religious orphanage because that is even not the they... sense I got at all. That's interesting because even when she's looking out the window with her two friends, wondering if he likes her. And they're saying, you're the minister's daughter. Like, they kind of make it seem like he's not, re- they're not really his foster parents. He's kind of just there living in this home. But whatever. If you want to think stepsister, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ruin your fantasy. Yeah. How dare you? How I'm dare so you accuse me of fantasizing about step siblings? Right. All right. No, you're right. I, for, I, first I, of all, for, we're all fantasizing about that. The internet is conspiring. Yep. To force yep. us all to want to fuck our step families. Yes, I am not here to disabuse you of any of the notions uh, that Hal Hartley or the world uh, are inclined to put in your head. Henry, what's your favorite uh, step family porn website? <laughs> uh, there was a. I think it started in 1986. I want a real. I want a real answer, Henry. Well, the night. It's called the Stepfather. And had two sequels. Full, <laughs> Your favorite step length. porn is Terry O'Quinn and the Stepfather. Well, all right, not really. My first one was Poison Ivy. Granted, not that doesn't really have step much. porn in it. Sure, it does. Drew Barrymore is pretty much kind of a kind of a step. Is she trying she... to fuck the dad in that? I it's guess not. so. Yeah, she is living it's there. Not. 
Isn't it Tom Skerritt? Yeah, you know, I'll give you that one. Poison Ivy's a little bit of step porn. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. Parker Posey was in the House of Yes. That's one. Yeah, I didn't see that, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. How about The Crush? That's sort of uh, on the... <laughs> it's teacher. That's teacher porn. The Crush? Right. The, the Leisha Silverstone? I think it's not oh, teacher. You're right. no, I think you're right. he's um, he's living in the in the guest house, and there she wants go. to fuck him. Uh, that's porn material. Yeah. That is porn material. Guest house. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't think yeah. I've ever jerked it to the crush, but I could. <laughs> <laughs> Same with the babysitter. <laughs> Fucking show this is. All right. Uh, what the fuck? All right, so 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 Ned leaves with he, a gun. He, he right. He wants to leave Ned. the parish or whatever to uh, murder his father Henry. But yeah, first, he's got to find him. He's got to find him. Uh, he views that uh, Henry Fool has ruined Fay Grimm's life. True, I would say. Uh, Fay is in prison for life as a cons. Conspiratorial terrorist. Yeah, pretty much the uh, only reference to the last movie is Faye's prison status. That's true. Mm-hmm. That's very true. Um, I think you're right initially when you said he, I think maybe maybe there was a little bit of distance. I mean, because this movie honestly is a lot more like the feel of the first movie. Of course it's, it is. It it's a back to basics approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it looks better. Uh, it's a little more, uh, I feel like he's a little more sure of himself in 2014 as a director but as a writer it's the same he's got the same feel yeah um, and it's it's more talky i think get. i think what you're portraying as as more um more uh, confident in himself or whatever is really just that he's shooting on digital now and so everything just looks better <laughs> more easily uh, henry oh, i think henry I full was it. the last movie he ever shot on film Oh really? Yeah, and I think moving to digital really affected the way he he approaches things. Maybe he made it, it it made him feel like he had to be quicker, or he just got he had fun with utilizing quicker cuts because there's definitely a less lot less lingering on shots. Well, and also it's a Kickstarter funded movie, so I don't think they had that much money. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. The poorest filmmaker ever who ever lived. I know. <laughs> it really is. Crazy. I mean, this guy's like makes films as though he's like literally. I picture him on the streets begging for money. Meanwhile, you got people who can shoot fucking films on cell phones mm-hmm. and they're getting Oscar nominations or Golden Globe nominated. I don't know what is Hal doing. Is he just the most Luddite filmmaker who ever? No, lived? he he made the transfer to digital film. I, I, look, this guy is a legend, and we are letting YouTube stars make movies now. Can. Someone give uh, Hal Hart. I, look, stars, <laughs> stars gave Greg Araki money to make a TV show and was like, "Hey, do whatever you want." Someone do that with Hal Hartley. Somebody get him the Hurley dog sitting service because he really needs it. Let the man make your film, please. Oh yeah, remember that? Yeah, I do. One of Chris the greatest Farley. skits. Whoever, one of the greatest skits who ever lived. Uh, yes, the Hurley dog boy. Dog sitting service. Great stuff, Henry. Um, uh, so Ned tracks Simon, his uncle, down yes. in, um, in New York. I, by the way, I love that we never see Simon in any of these movies without his garbage man uniform on. I love it, too. I really like it. He that. hasn't been a garbage man in this movie for 20 years, and yeah. he's still wearing that. Still got it, man. I guess he doesn't want to lose touch with his roots, or he's just not much of a dresser. Um, we're clearly in New York. Uh, we never see any street signs. I'm always looking for Let me see some street signs. Are. I couldn't find any. I saw a few. Where's that hotel he's staying in? I don't know about that. Is it the Chelsea Hotel? Is it a stand-in for the Chelsea Hotel? I don't know what it is, but he's, su- low he's living person. there, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, He's making his living. <laughs> he's doing stand-up comedy on YouTube, which I think is so fucking funny. I like that a lot. I didn't like the explanation as much when he deconstructs to Aubrey Plaza why he's doing it, or when he deconstructs to Ned. But I love Ned's reactions. <laughs> But I love that his stand-up is, like, not revered at all. Like, no one thinks it's bad, but it's just like, I thought you were a genius. What are you doing? Right, right. Yeah, that's very good. I like that. Did you catch uh, his uh, stand-up comedy coach? 
I mean, I knew going in because I had to do a uh, cast superhero uh-huh. count, but yeah, tell us who tell us who this guy is. It was Troma founder Lloyd Kaufman showing up, I, which surprised me. I don't really see Hal Hartley as being a big Troma guy. I don't know what to see in Hal Hartley. Who the fuck knows? He might watch Swamp Thing on a perpetual loop. He's an enigma. Swamp yeah, Thing. Pretty- you're uh, thinking of the Toxic Avenger. Toxic Avenger, yeah. I meant. Toxic Avenger, yeah, yeah, yeah. Swamp Thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Toxic Avenger and Swamp Thing. How could I be so silly? Well, how could you be so silly? They're very different. Swamp Thing is a very high-minded, philosophical piece of uh, literary comic booking, while uh, the Toxic Avenger is a gross-out uh, horror movie. That's a good point. I've never seen Swamp Thing. The original movie by Wes Craven? Never. It's worth yeah. watching. I mean, you should. Re- have you ever read the Alan Moore comics? No. Well, read those first, though. That's fucking yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, H Dog. Uh, so Ned is uh, hanging out with Simon, and yeah. he also runs into Simon Stalker downstairs in this hotel. And yes. This is a new character named Susan, um, who is played by Parks and Recreation's Aubrey Plaza. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm of two minds about this character, and this performance. I, I want to hear it. On the one hand, Aubrey Plaza is really good and a really engaging screen presence. Um, but, um, okay. It's a, it's a highly sexualized character. Oh, yes. And yeah. I am not sure... I'm not sure how much of this movie is the camera leering at her and how much of it is her doing the character. And I'm not sure how much of it is me leering at her. I agree with everything you said, especially the last part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's cause a she, insane. I mean, she's like ridiculously hot and she's it's crazy. Yeah. And the entire movie she's wearing like, fucking thigh high socks and fucking you know uh i i i feel like it's almost hal hartley watching parks and rec and being like you know it'd be really great to see her in a certain way <laughs> it, it it almost is like if aubrey plaza in an interview someone asked her like who she likes Ooh. and she was like i actually love the films of hal hartley i'd do anything to work with that guy and hal hartley at home was like anything <laughs> <laughs> I know it's it's almost like Hal Hartley was a little bit of uh, Henry Fool himself. It was a little odd. It was I, I picture Hal going like, "Do you want to rehearse this scene?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, because there's there's a lot of scenes where it's actually just her in a shot where she's like laying in bed or not facing the camera but she's just wearing a bra and it does look it doesn't take down the movie it is gratuitous but it also um says a lot about the character and is sort of important to the plot honestly it is weirdly but it is. still yeah i mean it's it's important to the plot but you would also probably lose not very much if if you didn't get those if shots. she was wearing like normal clothes well, well, not even necessarily normal, but just like those specifically in the bedroom sequences where she's just scantily clad and we get to watch Ned just put a blanket on her twice. She's <laughs> I mean, scantily a- clad everywhere, though. I mean, those fucking socks are ridiculous. When she runs into um, the other Hal Hartley guy um, and he says that he wants to write a poem about her thigh. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, 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 a bud in the movie, but I, I don't remember his name. But yeah, yeah, he's yeah, the guy yeah. I couldn't remember his name fucking last week, and I called him Bill Conti. He was in uh, Boiler Room. <laughs> <laughs> Is he? Who's he in Boiler Room? FBI agent who takes down uh, Rabisi once Rabisi to oh wear a wire. Oh my god, you're fucking right. I can picture that. Bill Sage <laughs> is the guy's name. Bill Sage. Yeah. 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 He's been in a lot of shit. Yeah. By the way, I I went um and I rewatched Trust this week because we were doing Hal Hartley. Yeah. I hadn't seen it in a long time. And uh, um, in that movie, they show somebody reading a novel, and the author's name on the spine is Ned Rifle. That's funny. Yeah. Oh, all right. Guess he follows in his dad's footsteps. Well, he Ned Rifle is a name Hal Hartley has used uh, also just, like, randomly. It's, oh. it's sort of like his... Um, 
You, you know how like the Coen brothers will like sometimes they're taking so many credits in a movie that when they edit a movie, they'll use Roderick James. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that, it's like his that. But Hartley uses it in just little cameos in a movie. He doesn't use it as no, a no, credit. No, no, no. I the... think like in Hal Hartley's early movies, like when he's credited as composer or whatever, he's not listed as Hal Hartley. Like it says Ned Rifle. Oh, okay. Okay. Interesting. I didn't know if you meant it was like a character's name that was just reused a la, uh, I had the director's name in my head and then it went out. Who's the director who uses, he'll throw a, a character will have the exact same name throughout several different movies and it's a completely different character. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Are you talking about Detective Munch? No. I'm no. sorry. I perked up. I, I thought we were talking about Detective Munch. Oh, good one but sorry no no no. doesn't matter it'll come back to me it's not important um susan yes so ned but, hooks but, up with this girl susan and when i say hook up i don't mean like makes out or whatever like they become friends we don't no. really know how old susan is it's implied that she's in her 30s um maybe early 30s and um she uh seems to have some kind of connection well she has written her like graduate thesis on the works of simon grimm and specifically on the ways his friendship with henry fool has influenced his poetry that's right that's right and uh i found that surprising i guess it should have been obvious but i still found it surprising it which was you mean the twist good, yeah i mean i i think it's good uh, but also then it kind of turned into this very, very strange thing towards the end where I did feel uncomfortable because when she does finally track down Henry, it's like this sort of forgiveness. And okay, well, we haven't said who she is. She, uh, so remember in Henry Fool, um, uh, Henry has been in prison for raping a 13-year-old. Or having sex with a 13-year-old, but still. Right. I mean, that right. is rape. Statutory um, rape. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, he, um, so it turns out that Susan is this 13-year-old. Right. And, um, and uh, she was fat and ugly back then, apparently, but now she's hot. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I do think Aubrey Plaza does a convincing job of, of or at least with me, she I didn't know which way she was going to go with this. I thought maybe she'd be totally having the same motivations as Ned Rifle in that she wants to kill him. Well, uh, I think she's of two minds. I, I think she kind of does want to kill him, but also she refers to the... Yeah, I do. I, I But she refers yeah. to the day that she had sex with Ned as a 13-year-old as the best day of her life. And well, yeah. yeah. She she also implies that when um, Henry got out of prison, she thought that he'd come find her and that they'd, like, go off and be together. Well, that's what I'm talking about. I didn't get an impression that she was looking to stalk out of revenge. It, it, it It's like Hartley is trying to say that she was a 13-year-old who actually wasn't scar i mean she was scarred obviously she spent years in psychiatric institutions but we're trying to say what we're trying to say she that this could happen that this would happen like a, that she would actually realize oh it's the love of my life I, yeah I, but i but i don't crazy, think right? we're meant to to empathize with her in that way i think that's what she believes but i think that we're meant to think that she feels that way now because she had no agency at 13 because uh, Henry made her feel special okay. and was maybe the first person to ever make her feel special. Okay. Yeah. And then he ran out on her. I, I, I feel like Aubrey Plaza only sort of makes the move to like try and get Hal, Hal Henry to be her man again because it seems to be going so well and because he seems receptive to it. I, okay. I don't think that that's how she entered the conversation. I, I have a feeling she wanted to track down Henry Fool and didn't exactly know what she was going to do. That might be true. I, I yeah, I, I was going to say also, I think one of the reasons Aubrey Plaza works, though, well in this movie is because she delivers this type of dialogue perfectly. This is her thing. I mean, yeah, it's crazy how much of a fit she is. I was thinking when I was first when she first came on screen, I was like uncomfortable for the first 
20 seconds of the dialogue. So I was like, is she doing a little bit to April Ludgate? And then it was kind of like, no, that's kind of exactly what. No, it's just that April Ludgate is. is kind of a Hal Hartley character. Yeah, very much so. So she does it perfectly. And uh, it should be said, as you as you stated earlier, you said uh, uh, Ned Rifle and her do not. Uh, uh, I don't know what word you use was consummate. Uh, Ned Rifle has the greatest Im- uh, willpower of any human being on the face of the earth. Why do you say that? that? Oh, no, no, no reason. Um, you know, he is devoted to Jesus, folks. Let's put it that way. Oh, Ned. I'm sorry. I was thinking you were talking about Henry. Um, no, 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 no. You're right. Yeah, She gives him a total opportunity to fuck her. And um, she even like when he sleeps outside his car, like comes out and is like, you should have slept with me last night. <laughs> but yeah, he's he's devoted to Jesus. He's, he keeps referring to himself as chaste, which I thought was funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm great... chaste. I'm not going to have sex till I'm married. Uh, uh, you're what? <laughs> chaste. It means I know what it means. <laughs> There's a lot of those funny type of exchanges in this. I mean, in all of these movies, but especially in this one, there's a lot of like I, great double takes and repartee between the characters who, who do know what each other's saying. But yeah, as- I love him him telling Parker Posey that, too, because yeah. she was sort of a promiscuous mother and <laughs> she's confused that like this person could come out of her loins. <laughs> Come out of her loin. Yeah. <laughs> Very biblical way of putting it. Yes. Yes. Mm. Uh, yeah. So uh, where do we go from here? Well, so Ned meets Henry in a psychiatric ward where Henry. It's not a, it's kind of not a psych. Uh, is it a psychiatric ward? It's like it, 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 apparently it's he had, he clever. had signed up for a drug trial. Right. Right. And right. something went wrong and he's ha- having hallucinations that he's the devil and they're keeping him there. But then when Ned finally meets Henry, he says that he just is staying there because it's good shelter and he's not actually having hallucinations. Right. But then he does have a couple that aren't for show. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I imagine he has a little bit of after effects, but mainly he's just freeloading there he's, he's squatting in this fucking hospital he's got his whiskey stored in the library shelf. i loved that <laughs> yeah and i mean i like that he has like a space heater out in the middle of a park where he's just like good afternoon mademoiselles <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's just very weird but you know and they go off on a road trip from there which is a really right. fun section of the movie Yeah, you know, but something happened to me during this section, which I didn't expect. And I think it might be because we've had rapid fire uh, Henry Fool movies when they were in the car and she's and Aubrey Plaza is essentially taking dictation uh, as his like stenographer. I was actually getting tired of Thomas J. Ryan. I was getting tired of Henry Fool. And I didn't think that could happen. But I felt that way in this um, movie yeah. too. And I, I think you're kind of supposed to, where he's like this sort of out there hero in the first one. I think oh. I think in this movie we're meant to sort of take him to task a little bit more. Like you did fuck a thirteen year old. Well it wasn't just that though. It was that that was running through it, but it was just I started to find him as I didn't find him even in Faye Grimm. I found him to be kind of exhausting. And it might be because I think his appearance in this movie is very, very similar to his appearance in the first movie where he's just doing the same thing again and again and, and again. And he's also getting older like he's he's aging and, and you see that in Thomas J. Ryan and he's just like learned nothing. It seems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he has a little bit of perspective about the situation with Susan where like he he uh, seems to understand that what he did was wrong. But what he did was so wrong. And, and it, can, it it's like wronger than we even thought. Like the details we get in the movie were like Susan says, I really thought my parents were going to be out of town. And yeah. the fact that like Ned recognizes her for the first time, because there's a whole section of the movie where Susan is just like pretending to be a random person named Susan and they don't know that she has this connection to Henry and Henry first gets to understand that this is the person he fucked when she gets cigarettes and rum at a convenience right. store or a, right. at a grocery and and he says like that was always your thing back when I knew you yeah. and it's like that's what, you're fucking a 13 year old girl and plying her with cigarettes and alcohol while her parents are out of town <laughs> and you're the hero 
Yeah, exactly. You're right. It, it gets more and more disgusting. And I think whereas in the first movie, his musings and ramblings and pseudo philosophical vitriol is entertaining. And be, but we're also seeing it it's through not anymore. B- because yeah. in the first one, we're seeing it through the eyes of, of Simon, man. Right. And Simon, yeah. th- he's opening something up in Simon yeah. and inspiring yes. Simon. In this yeah. movie, we're seeing him through the eyes of Ned, who wants to fucking kill him, and yeah. Susan, whose life he like irreparably changed. Yeah, and we and we do see Ned try to kill him, but Susan's taking the bullet out of the gun, uh, which I thought was a funny a, we- a funny sequence because I like I would have in a way I like that Ned almost kills him if he would have had the bullet while. Henry is just taking a piss in the woods. It's like the most ignominious way to go. And it would have made, it would have been kind of great, but, uh, I loved that scene. They, you know, yeah. they built tension pretty well in that scene. And I yeah. like that he's peeing on the side of the road. <laughs> that was amusing. Yeah, yeah. To me. yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, uh, then we get, but then we get, unfortunately we get treated to this bizarre sex scene where, you know, Aubrey Plaza and Henry Fool get to do it, but they're like knocking shit around in the hotel and they're turning the lights off. I mean, it's very, very strange. Well, it's this like epic fucking sex scene where like they're fucking so hard that they knock the satellite dish off the roof of the motel. She pulls the power out of the wall. I mean, it's just so bizarre. And then sure enough, uh, the next morning it was, he leaves. (laughs) Yeah. He's so fucking ugly. I don't know how it's like. I kind of like like that, though. You know, it's why Ron Jeremy. It's why Ron Jeremy was such a popular porn star. I think there's something appealing about watching like a ridiculously hot person getting fucked by a troll. (laughs) He's certainly a troll in both personality and physicality. Yeah, and then he leaves her again, and uh, but then he he doesn't right. He stops the car. On the on the on the very upset hitchhiking couple who I thought were very funny, because for some reason this the, part, yeah, the couple where the wife is like, "No, you're not getting a ride," and the husband's like, "Honey," and they give the guy a ride, they give Henry a ride, and then he's like, "No, I can't oh, do this." Oh, that's and, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so he goes back, and Aubrey Plaza, I guess, is so upset that she's been left again. That uh, she seems to like, if I'm remembering the chronology correctly, which I might not be, she's hiding in the corner with the gun and he just kind of runs in. The police are there. Why are they there? That nothing's happened yet. The police have arrived because of the previous evening. Because they fucked up the whole motel. The motel owner called the police. I I, I think that... um... This is one of the reasons I thought that the intention for Aubrey Plaza's character wasn't to, like, get back together with Henry. Because I think that, like, she, w- once Henry is, like, treating her like an adult and, and you know, like a possible partner, then she gets pulled into it. And I think the second she wakes up and Henry's gone, she's like, he did it to me fucking again. Yeah. I agree, but I still feel like when she shoots him at the end, it's an accident. I didn't feel it was, yeah, because he. I feel like she's just. But she's it's lost like, it. but it's a crime of passion kind of a thing. The, well, I, the way I took it was, I agree with everything you just said. That she's, she's now. It's like the last straw. She's like, oh my god, he did it to me again. I'm, I'm gonna lose my shit. But I think she was ready to just shoot whoever came in that door. Because it doesn't give it any reaction time. It, she looks like she barely recognizes. I mean, she just shoots the gun. I mean, he's barely through the well, door. Well, she's also so. probably on edge because the police are outside. Right. So I don't even think it was like an intentional murder. No, maybe uh, not. But I don't think that she's unhappy that it happened. Yeah, I couldn't tell. It didn't seem like she was. But for certain, it seemed like she wanted to kill herself after she tries. With oh, the gun. well, yeah. She's desperately trying. It, that's a scary scene, actually. It she's is, just, like, running is. around the motel room trying to stab herself on shit. Well, yeah. I mean, he, he Ned gets the knife, the cleaver before... Not the cleaver, but the whatever knife, the Ginsu, before she does. And then, much like... Henry kills Kevin Corrigan in the first movie. Oh, that's right. I didn't even think of that. Great parallel. 
Yeah, it's she runs into Ned, and poor Ned accidentally stabs her. But she does it intentionally. Like, Kevin Corrigan's trying to get at Henry in that moment in the first one to, like, punch him. Whereas in this one, like, Henry has a hold of this knife that he's trying to keep from her, and she just sort of lunges at him. Yeah, she does. I mean, it's... It's debatable whether she's trying to get the knife from him to kill herself or she just. I think she's trying to get herself stabbed. Yeah. Well, that's what happens. And then, I mean, Christ almighty. The the funny part is the the good part is, is that when when Ned goes outside and he sees his dad for the last time, he his dad says, run. Well, weirdly moving because he's trying to look out for his son. But Ned also being like, no. That I thought that I found that to be an incredibly moving exchange of two words. Um, yeah, because yeah. Uh, to me, it, it is Henry just in in his his impulse is always to run, right? No matter what. And um, we've talked about how Henry is prone to doing the same things over and over again, making the same mistakes again and again. And so, to me. Henry saying run to Ned and and Ned saying no was like breaking the cycle of, yep. of like this entire family where, where it's almost like perhaps it's, now it, it, with Ned being taken by the police and he didn't do anything wrong. He'll probably be let go. I um, hope so. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's. It, well, I think he's breaking his family's. Uh, it's sort of a like a, the myth of Sisyphus. It's just making it's doing the same thing over and over and over in perpetuity. Right. And Ned is able to break that. Yeah. You know he's trying I mean? to give some peace to this family. Yeah. Did you like that reference? Is that why you made that face? It was a <laughs> high brow. I mean, for the franchise to be referencing Sisyphus was uh, was pretty good. Well, I think that's what Hartley might have been doing because Henry just keeps doing the same stupid shit over and over and over again. I'll just be over yeah. here referencing Ron Jeremy and you can That's fine. Yeah. I'll reference Camus' book The Myth of Sisyphus. That's totally fine with me. Great stuff. <laughs> what do you give this movie? I'm actually giving this movie four stars. I am too. I kind of loved it. I'd never seen it before. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, I realized I had said uh, last week and even the prior week when we were talking about it, I do think I had seen uh, parts of the ending of this movie. Really? Before. It, it felt familiar. Yeah, it felt familiar to me. I, I, I must have just checked in on it when it was on TV or Saw something. Saw Aubrey Plaza being hot and stopped for a minute? Probably. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to. That's probably what I did. That's Five, why I've watched years. part of the to-do list. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but uh yeah, I didn't really remember it at all. And um but it was essentially like not seeing it ever. Uh but I give it four stars. I, I am going to give my MVP to Aubrey Plaza because Same. She, I, I really thought she was spectacular in this movie. She really and I, is. I was worried about her being in this movie. I wasn't sure she'd be able to pull it off as much as I like her in other things. Right. It's, it's, it's a complicated thing being in a Hal Hartley movie, I think. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and I, I thought she really nailed it. She, she had star quality. She was, um, very charismatic and watchable on the screen, not you just because she's eye- hot. Uh, yeah. No, you can't I mean, take your eyes off her. She, she's really, she's doing something interesting yeah. at all times. Yep. She's very dynamic. And, uh, I actually had a pretty easy LVP cause I feel like he was just kind of wasted and it might be because I've seen him in so many movies where he's, he's actually really good even in bit parts. And I'm thinking of a, a movie, right? I just thought of two movies like right away, even though I, I know we've seen Martin Donovan in a lot of movies, but I'm thinking of him like in the opposite of sex. And I'm thinking of him even in a very minor role in, in Nolan's, uh, insomnia where he is even very good in the role he's given in that and in here he's just kind of they throw a minister's collar on him and he's kind of just not it's just kind of a waste i, I thought I, he was I, charming and it's nice to see him because he's a hal guy look i uh I, I will say um speaking of nolan um that's exactly what i was talking about with the whole roderick jane's ned rifle pseudonym thing it's like how nolan when he um uh dps a movie he uses the name wally fister <laughs> Right. That's 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 good. That's good. Thanks, bro. It's it's kind of like kind of like what Spielberg does with the first Poltergeist, right? He uses that (laughs) sort of pooper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah, I get it. I I I feel you. Yeah. 
So I was, that, I was like, actually going to go with the mom as my LVP, Martin Donovan's wife. That was going to be my second. Mm-hmm. So there you go. So basically that couple, or at least in my mind, yeah, uh, she's not. She, I, she's also a Hal person. I've seen her in other stuff, and she's a good actress. But um, uh, yeah, pretty pretty nothing in this. She what did, you, what did, I felt that Martin Donovan added something to his small role that she didn't add to hers. What did you think of two things? One thing that I thought was really good, I love this touch, Faye Grimm in jail uh, reading off the longest books that she can give everybody for the book club so she's starting. So fucking funny. Yeah, yeah, that's right. She's starting a book club. We're going to be in here a while, so I figured let's start with the longest ones. We've got a lot of time. <laughs> And, and she's reading the names, the authors, and the page count of all of them. Yeah. It's great. War and Peace, Don Quixote, yeah. and uh, 1,294 Les pages. Le- yeah, she says Les Miserables. They made this into a play. Yeah, musical. A musical, made, yeah. Musical. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, we both gave it four, and we both gave Henry Fool four. Uh, our only big difference was Faye, where you gave it two and I gave it three. What are your uh, What are your rankings here? Number one for me is still Henry Fool. It's that '90s Hal Hartley magic that I love. Just that whole run of movies. I love just the feel of them, and they're so entertaining and funny and and specific and interesting. Uh, I thought Ned Rifle was was really as good a sequel as you can do. With with Faye Grimm in the middle, so my um my ranking is um a Henry Fool, Ned Rifle, and then a a little bit of a cavernous gap, and then Faye Grimm. Yeah, mine are the exact same rankings. The cavern, it's not quite a cavern as cavernous a gap, but uh, these are three very good movies, especially the original, and and this last one. I recommend I recommend all three. But yeah, uh, I don't I don't think people should yeah. skip Faye Grimm. But like if you're having no. a hard time with Faye Grimm, just know that the next one's a little more like. the first Yeah, one. it's true. There's light at the end of the uh, proverbial uh, tunnel. And, f- do- and Ned Rifle, baby. Hour and 25 minutes. Very short. Very short. It works well. Uh, I have another short superhero count of three. Uh, you get to guess. Oh, Jesus. Who's in this well, movie actually, that wasn't in previous? Two of the ones you probably won't guess, but I I think you should get this first one. By the way, I, ju- I, I think that Hal Hartley should get credit for using the same actor as Ned Rifle in all three movies. He's a fucking that, child in the first That one. was the second thing I wanted to say when I just said I wanted to say two things. The first was about Faye Groom in the library. The second was Liam Aiken. He's lucky. He's lucky. Liam Aiken grew up into an okay actor, but uh, but I mean, it's kind of an amazing thing. It's like a fucking boyhood project, but Hal gets no credit for anything. Uh, it's the Seven Up thing, right? It's it's, it's that whole <laughs> yeah. Thing. yeah yeah make Seven uh, Up yours. Remember those commercials? I Orlando clear, Jones, your Pepsi. Do you remember um, Orlando Jones? He had Make Seven on the front of his shirt, and then Up Yours on the back. So it'd be like, make seven up yours. That great movie with him where he's the star and he gets to play sort of a magical creature. It's quite famous. Orlando Jones plays a magical creature. Eh, 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 Oh, yeah. It's got to be on Dan's rewatch list. Uh, It was (laughs) like one of the worst movies of the year considered by everybody. Uh, Orlando. Is is he the star of it? It's it's like the evolution time period when he was in that. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Well, that's sort of the seven up commercial time period. Yeah, Yeah. Well. All right. Well, I mean, what is it? He's on American Gods. He plays like a weirdo on that. That's not what you're thinking of. Oh no, no, it's a long time ago. Okay, hang on. I'm I'm looking at his. He's like a fucking genie or some kind of terrible. He's a genie. Some shit like that. Um, Wait, Osmosis Jones. Osmosis Jones. That's not Orlando Jones. That's another black guy. No, it's a cartoon character. Well, is that what I'm thinking of? That wasn't a movie? I mean, it was a movie. The Farrelly Brothers directed it, but it's like, um, it's Bill Murray's in it, and he plays like a sick guy, and then we like see inside of his body, and there's like a superhero named Osmosis Jones who's trying to like fight off germs. And that character isn't Orlando Jones. I don't think so. Jesus Christ. I, I, I really feel like I'm not wrong. Any other things? I just in think, you, I, I think you, you did the Jones thing. You put that together. I, I put the Jones thing together. Osmosis oh, okay. Jones was played by Chris Rock. It was the voice of Chris Rock. Okay, I guess it wasn't that then. 
Jesus, what a misfire. All right, whatever. I think it's uh, great. I think you nailed it. Yeah, I, I, I really did. Aubrey Plaza. I thought you'd get this. Oh, was, she's uh, in a superhero thing? Yes. Let me think about it. Aubrey Plaza. You want me to tell you if it's a movie or TV at least? Uh, oh, I know it. I know it. She she played sort of like one of the many guises of the Shadow King on Legion. There you go. You got it. She was great Are... on that fucking show. Scary. Yeah? yeah. Oh, really? That is know. like, this has some like April Ludgate in it. If you're a Parks fan, that doesn't. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Martin Donovan um, was in Ant-Man. Um, he played Mitchell Carson. I, I, I think... I think I remember him in that. I think he's like a cop or some shit. He's like an actual character in Ant-Man. So I don't remember. Um, yeah. And he plays Z Zaman Drus in Legends of Tomorrow. Oh, I kind of remember that. Yeah. That was first season Legends of Tomorrow. Four episodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Last but not least, Lloyd Kaufman, who played Zach, the comedy agent. Were you counting the Toxic Avenger? <laughs> No, uh, I was counting him playing a prisoner in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Right, because he gave James Gunn his start. Oh, he did? Yeah, okay. yeah. James Gunn got his start working for Troma. A lot of people did. He's sort of like a modern Roger Corman in that way. Oh, all right. I didn't know that. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we did it, everybody. Episode what a one, fun 99. time.